Hello and welcome back to educator.com. Today's unit is on genome organization and we'll focus on chromatin and nucleosomes. As an overview, we'll first go over a real quick glossary of terms just so that we're all on the same uh, page. Then we will mainly focus on our genome variants and our nucleosomes. Now, our quick glossary, just in case we don't know any of these terms, um, DNA, right? That's our genetic material that we find inside each cell. A gene, that's going to be our molecular unit of heredity, all right? So this is a piece of DNA that will encode any type of functional product, whether that's a protein or an RNA. Uh, we have a nucleosome, and that's going to be the fundamental subunit of chromatin. And that's just a basic unit of DNA packaging in our uh, eukaryotes. And this consists of DNA wound around a histone octamer. And we'll talk further about what that is. We have chromatin. Now, this is a complex of DNA protein, DNA and protein that forms chromosomes. And we only find these in eukaryotes. Uh, chromatin, that is, not chromosomes. Um, and then we have a chromosome. And that's a tightly packaged and organized structure of DNA and proteins, including our histone as well as non-histone proteins. And then finally, a genome. That's just the complete copy of the entire sequence of DNA of an organism. So let's talk about how a lot of these fit into play. So if we go from the most zoomed in, all right, we have genes. Okay, which are consisted, uh, consist of introns and exons. And then we have intergenic regions, so non-genes, right? And all of that is pieces of DNA, right? So these are the small zoomed in units. If we zoom out a little bit, right? Genes to DNA, right? Then DNA, we can compact that DNA, compact it over and over and over again by winding it around nucleosomes, right? Now, nucleosomes can compact more and more and more, forming types of chromatin. So remember, chromatin is just DNA and protein um, uh, interactions. So this, say, would be an example of a type of chromatin down here. And then as we compact even more, we have all of our chromatin compacting into cro a chromosome, right? And if we remember, as humans, we have 23 sets of chromosomes. We're diploid, so we have 46 chromosomes, right? Remember, we have chromosomes 1 to 22, and then we have the X and Y chromosomes. So let's talk about the physical cellular differences between eukaryotes and prokaryotes quickly. Now, eukaryotes, so these are cells with nuclei. If we look down here, the difference between a eukaryote and prokaryote, the biggest one is that we have a nucleus in a eukaryote, and in a prokaryote, they do not. They have what's called a nucleoid, which is very similar. That's kind of where their DNA and protein are, are held together, but it's not enclosed in a membrane. Um, eukaryotes may also have some extra things, such as mitochondria, and that um, prokaryotes do not normally have. Um, so eukaryotes are the biggest, all right? We're anywhere from, you know, 10 microns to 15 microns, right? Which is uh, micrometers. Um, we can't even be bigger than that. Uh, smaller than eukaryotes are prokaryotes, right? Are bacteria types of things. Smaller than that, viruses. And then the things smaller than viruses are what makes up all of life, right? So we have our atoms, our small molecules, our, our proteins, right? These are going to be found in all of our viruses, prokaryotes, and eukaryotes. So it's important to know that there's a variance of genomes, right? And so since we're going to talk a lot about human stuff in, in this um, in this entire course, uh, we will also talk about prokaryotes, right? Bacteria, especially our E. coli. So we want to know um, kind of a relationship between all of them. So first, let's talk about humans. Most of our genome, most of our genome does not code 
for anything, right? So it isn't, it isn't composed mainly of genes. It's composed mainly of intergenic regions. So more than 60% of the human genome does not code for a gene, okay? And 46% of the total genome, okay, 46% of the total DNA is repetitive sequences, and that's often referred to as junk DNA. Um, but that's a misnomer, and that's not a term that we should be using because um, just because we don't know that it has some sort of a function doesn't mean that it actually doesn't have a function. Um, there are uh, studies coming out every year that's finding what normally was thought of as junk DNA or even non-coding RNA coming out as as being coding for something or as being involved in some sort of gene regulation. So you can regulate the way that genes are expressed higher or lower, even in the non-gene sequences, so the intergenic regions. Now, genes compose less than 40% of the total DNA, and of that, less than 5% is actually the exons. Remember, the exons are what is actually going to be um, added into the protein, right? So it's it has the instructions to how to make the protein. The introns are what is cleaved out of the mRNA. Now, if we look down at this chart that I've made down here, I have four different organisms on here. I have a very simple virus, which is the bacteriophage virus. It infects bacteria. It's called Phi-X174. Then we have our old friend E. coli, and then Drosophila melanogaster. So E. coli is a bacterium. Drosophila melanogaster is the common fruit fly. And then we have us, the humans. Now, in general, genome size is roughly positively correlated with the complexity of an organism. So um, the bigger the genome size, right, for the more complex, right, organism and the smaller the genome size for the least complex individual on here, right? And this is size of DNA in terms of megabases, so um, uh, thousands of bases, all right? So um, also another general thing that you can talk about is that genome density, so the amount of genes per base pair sequence basically, um, is roughly negatively correlated with the complexity of the organism. So a very simple organism like the bacteriophage has a much higher density of genes found in its genome than humans, which we have a very low genome density or gene density in our genome. We have about 20,000 genes, but that's spread out over more than 3 billion bases, whereas the uh, bacteriophage here has 11 genes, but it has an extremely small genome, right? So we're talking about 50,000 or uh, about 5,000 bases, all right? Good. Now, for our first example, let's talk about how big the human genome is. Well, I said it's over 3 billion base pairs long, and that's just the haploid genome, right? We are a diploid organism, so we have twice the amount of that. So the length of just that 3 billion base pairs, if we were to spread it all the way out, okay, that is a meter, right? So close to 3 feet. Well, the diploid length, right, we have to double it, so that's 2 meters, so, almost, so about 6 feet around of DNA. Well. The diameter of a human cell is only about 10 to 15 micrometers, right? Microns. So what do we, what does that really mean? Can we, can we understand the size of that? So if our cell was actually the size of a basketball, if we blew it up to the size of a basketball um, and everything else accordingly, well, then our genome would actually be able to stretch from the earth to the moon, okay, just based on the size comparison. So this to me says that we need a really good way of compacting that DNA, 
all right? Because we can't have the six feet of six feet of DNA inside a cell that you can't even see with your naked eye, right? So we need to compact that really well, and we need a way of uncompacting things, right? Decondensing or condensing things based on whether we need to do things such as replication, transcription, repair, so on and so forth. So that's what this unit is all about. So first of all, let's talk about chromosome variants. Now, we're going to have size and density variants even in between a single cell. And then we'll have a chromosome variants in terms of number in between different organisms. So once again, a reminder, a chromosome, we have a tightly packaged and organized structure of DNA and proteins, including both histone and non-histone proteins. And right here, we have a graph showing human chromosomes. We have our total number of genes um, in pink here, and we have the total base pairs in blue or uh, green. And as we can see, between individual chromosomes in the same cell, right, we have not only a difference or a variance between chromosomes in genes, but we also have a variance in terms of base pairs. And if we look at two that are fairly similar in, in, in size, such as one and two, we also have a difference in or a variance in gene density, right? Because we have so many more genes for barely that much more base pairs. So this is something that we should always keep in mind uh, that chromosomes are going to vary by size, number, and density uh, between organisms and even within the same organism. So first off, let's talk about the eukaryotic cell cycle. And why do I kind of bring this out of nowhere? Well, the reason being, let's go back to this because we've talked about it in, in uh, one of the previous units and we will talk about it in the next unit again. Uh, remember, we have our two gap phases, our growth phases, G1 and G2. We have S phase, which is where DNA replication occurs. And then we have mitosis, right, M phase. And that is where we have our uh, the splitting of our cells into two new daughter cells. Well, the reason I talk about this is that we have to know that when we replicate DNA, we are going to have to replicate a lot of other things relating to DNA. So one of these things that we're going to have to do is, yes, we duplicate our DNA and then we segregate our DNA or separate it. Well, in prokaryotes, that happens at the same time. In eukaryotes, that happens in two different phases. We duplicate in S phase, we segregate in M phase, right? And duplication and specifically segregation relies on centromeres and telomeres. Right, And then duplication is going to rely on our origins of replication. Now, if I draw out a chromosome, just a real rough drawing. Okay, we'll just draw it out like this, let's say. Okay, so we've already duplicated it. Okay, let's say that. All right, um, actually, let's start with before it's duplicated. If we have one chromosome, okay, Along the chromosome in eukaryotes, we're going to have multiple places where we have origins of replication. And that means that that is where the DNA synthesis during replication can begin. Now, if we're talking about a bacteria, it has a single origin of replication. And that's because it's circular. If you replicate it at one place, it'll actually start replicating in both directions until it ends at the terminal point. But since eukaryotes, we do not have uh, circular, G, uh, circular uh, chromosomes. We have linear chromosomes. We start at many different places, so that way it ensures that we can finish replication um, before we move through S phase. So those are our origins, origins of replication. Now, after we have, let's say, um, replicated our chromosomes, we're going to have a centromere. 
Now, a centromere is going to be a bunch of repetitive sequence in, in the chromosome, and that's where our two um, chromosomes are going to bind together um, during our, our M phase. Now, it can be in the center, it can be on one end or the other, so on and so forth, and that's fine. Now, our telomeres are always going to be at the ends of our chromosomes. Okay, so these are telomere sequences, and this is just repetitive sequences um, that cap the ends of our chromosomes and allow us to have some sort of protection from nucleolytic cleavage as well as um, having adhesion, so binding to another chromosome, okay, which would be a very bad thing. All right, so we need centromeres and telomeres, as well as origins of replication, to proceed through proper duplication and segregation of chromosomes. Now, remember, I said we need to have a way to condense our chromosomes quite a lot. Well, we have our naked duplex DNA to start with. Okay, then we can compact it with nucleosomes. And we're going to talk more about nucleosomes in this um, in this lecture, but this is just a, a, a nice little preview. This is our beads on a string, or our 10 nanometer fiber. That can be even more compacted when you add in a linker histone, H1, to make the 30 nanometer solenoid fiber. That can be extended even more by chromosome scaffolding and eventually condensed in mitosis to look like the stereotypical X, right? It looks like that X, uh, real dark X chromosome. Okay, not X is in the sex chromosome, X is in the letter X. So we need all this to happen, right? So, so I showed on that last one, we had that mitotic chromosome being extremely condensed. Well, the reason this needs to happen in mitosis is that we need to be able to separate our daughter strands. So we need to make sure that everything's condensed into their individual units, their individual chromosomes, so that we can properly segregate everything so that nothing gets tangled up. So if we remember mitosis, we start with, on the, in this example, two different chromosomes. You duplicate those chromosomes. Then you split that one cell into two different daughter cells, each one of which has the exact copies of that first red chromosome and that second blue chromosome. So real quickly, we'll go over what mitosis is. So it's split into multiple phases. First off, we start with prophase. Now prophase is when we start condensing our chromatin into chromosomes, right? So this is where we're gonna start to get more and more condensed. In prometaphase, we have the nuclear envelope Okay, the nuclear envelope starting to disintegrate. And that nuclear envelope needs to disintegrate so that you can start moving the uh, duplicated chromosomes away from each other. All right? So remember, once we've gone through mitosis, or once we've started mitosis, we've already gone through S phase. So we've already have twice as many chromosomes, right? So we have two times the amount of chromosomes that we want in every cell. So we have the nuclear envelope disintegrating, and then we have microtubules coming in. All right, to grab onto those chromosomes. So the microtubules attach to kinetochores. Now, kinetochores bind to the centromere of the chromosome. So we have kinetochores binding on here, okay? Kinetochore binding onto the, centros uh, the centromere. And then that allows the microtubules to attach to the kinetochore, and eventually they pull in either direction, separating the chromosome, so it breaks the, the centromere part, okay? So in metaphase, the next step, this, this is all occurring throughout entire mitosis, not just in prometaphase, okay? Uh, in metaphase, we have the chromosomes aligning at the metaphase plate, so it's basically the midline of the cell. The next part of mitosis is called anaphase, and that's when the chromosomes split. Okay, so the the, centri uh, the centromere breaks, right? You can break the centromere apart, or you break the uh, the um, chromosomes apart at that centromere. Okay, so the chromosomes split, and the kinetochore microtubules, so the microtubules attach to each kinetochore, right? And the kinetochore is attached at the centromere. 
So those are being pulled in opposite directions. So as to be at the, each pole of the cell. So this pole and this pole, which will eventually be two separate daughter cells. So in telophase, we have these decondensing chromosomes. So now they're starting to, to not be as compacted. They're starting to release a little bit. Okay, they get reformed, okay, or re, um, what forms around them newly is new nuclear envelopes. And we start to do what's called telophase or uh, cytokinesis. And the cytokinesis is the actual separation into two different daughter cells. So we have the, the cells pinching in, right? And this is what we call a cleavage pharaoh. The cells start pinching in and eventually pinches off to have two separate cells. And in this case, each one of these cells has the exact amount of chromosomes as the original parent cell before it went through S phase. <clears throat> so we have to talk about a couple really important protein complexes when we talk about mitosis and when we talk about proper chromosome segregation. So we have what are called cohesins and condensins. So this is cohesin and this is condensin. All right. Now cohesins are loaded during replication. All right, condensins more are uh, being loaded during uh, M phase, all right? And what actually happens is if we look at a chromosome, okay, this is a duplicated chromosome, we have cohesins binding around, okay, using this little hinge, binding around the chromosomes, okay? And this is binding our sister chromatids together, right? So this is binding our sister chromatids together. Now, this is, once again, in uh, uh, S phase. Now, when we, so I'll tell you S phase. Now, when we go into mitosis, so we have prophase, we still have our chromosomes, okay, and they still have our cohesin holding the sister chromatids together. But as we're in, and this is, sorry, this is prophase, let's remember. Prophase, we're starting to condense our chromosome. So what we have, how we can do that is condensin will come in in metaphase okay so in metaphase we'll go over here okay this is now metaphase okay we still have our condensins, okay, and we'll make this easier. Sorry, those are our cohesins. Condensin will be in red. So our condensins in metaphase will start binding these together, right? So our condensins after replication compact each sister, um, each sister chromatid individually. So making it scoot in even more and more and more. And then if we move on toward anaphase, uh, okay, in anaphase we actually have our condensins still on there, but, oh, let's write this out, anaphase, 
but our condensins have been, or sorry, our cohesins have been cleaved. Our condensins are still there. Our cohesins get cleaved in anaphase. So really, what we have is this kind of becomes, you know, a little, a little squiggly, right? Because it's no longer bound to each other, right? It's squiggly here too. Okay, so it's no longer bound there, but it's important that cohesins get cleaved because that allows the separation of these uh, sisters, right? So that this one can go to one cell, this one can go to another cell, but we still have a little compaction. And eventually, once we have separated them into different cells, the nuclear envelope starts to form, these condensins can then start to be cleaved. So um, what we have just to show us right here, SMC, all these are cohesins and condensins. They're related proteins, a part of the SMC complex. SMC stands for structural maintenance of chromosomes. All right, so um, it's important that we have this compaction and cohesin and condensins play a large role in the actual condensing or compaction of DNA. Remember, we have our cohesins binding sister chromatids. together and condensins bind sister chromatids individually. All right. Um, this slide I already talked a little bit about, but just want to reiterate, we have our cohesins being loaded during replication and being cleaved during mitosis, right? They're cleaved during anaphase, and they are cleaved via the enzyme separase, right? And this occurs right as we are moving into anaphase. So it's actually occurring at the end of metaphase. Um, and separase is what then allows the sisters to be segregated into individual cells. All right. So um, I, one thing that I that I just want to mention about the previous slide is that after replication, those spindle microtubules have attached to the kinetochores, and they pull in opposite directions until those cohesin. Uh, proteins get cleaved. Okay, so separase is in there, cleaving as well as kinetochores are pulling apart, and eventually um, that allows you to proceed into anaphase. All right, so now that we've talked about the mitotic chromosomes, um, we need to talk about well, what about when we're not in mitosis, right? We still need to have some sort of compaction of the chromosome. Well, that's occurring via nucleosomes. All right, so we have what's called a histone core. And the histone core is composed of eight histone proteins. Now, these histone proteins are positively charged, and that's great because ne negatively charged DNA, right, will attract positively charged proteins. <clears throat> and what we have, if we look down here at the... Uh, at the octamer of core histones, we have two dimers of H2A and H2B, meaning there's two of each of those. We have a tetramer of H3, H4, meaning we have two of each of the H3s and H4s. And around that, we have 147 base pairs of DNA. And that DNA is wound around that nucleo nucleosome right, wound around 1.65 times. So the DNA is wound around that histone octet 
0.65 times, 1.65 times. Right? Now, we have what's called linker DNA, and that's what will link many different nucleosomes together, because remember, we're not just going to compact one little spot. And the linker DNA between those nucleosomes is anywhere from about 20 to 60 base pairs. Okay? So a single nucleosome will compact DNA about sixfold, right? If they're just in the nucleosome, or, um, and we have a bunch of nucleosomes all the way throughout, right? So just nucleosomes, remember, we're looking at the 10 nanometer fiber here. The 10 nanometer fiber is sixfold compaction. All right. Well, we need to compact even more. Remember, we have three billion base pairs, right? Over two meters of cells when we're in diploid, one over one meter of cells when we're in haploid form. So we need to condense even more. And what can help with that is histone H1, also known as the linker histone. So that allows the transition from this 10 nanometer fiber, which we just talked about, which is just the nucleosomes, right? And then linker DNA into the 30 nanometer solenoid, okay? And this helps compact DNA about 40 fold. So from six fold to 40 fold between the 10 nanometer and the 30 nanometer fiber. So when you're not in mitosis, further compaction of DNA can be mediated by the organization of these 30 nanometer filaments into loops, okay? So these are our 30 nanometer filaments in loops. And that can consist of 40 to 90 kilobases per loop, all right? And that can associate with, a pro with scaffolding. So we can get more and more and more compaction because we need it. I mean, that's the, that's the simple aspect behind it. We need all this compaction, and there is an intelligent design behind this. All right, and then if we want to talk mitosis, you can get even more condensed and eventually get to that mitotic chromosome. Um, but these, you can't really do much with. You, you know, there's, not really replica there's no replication, no transcription, none of that stuff happening during mitosis. No repair. So histones, as they bind DNA to compact it, they take up available binding spots because proteins like to bind DNA, but they don't like to bind DNA when there's already something there. So these histones will decrease any available binding spot on the DNA. So meaning it basically makes it unavailable for anything to bind and therefore affect whether it maybe is transcribing or replicating or being repaired or having interactions and bringing two pieces of pro, uh, DNA together. Well, our histone tails, we've talked about the histones that are in the middle, right? And in this case, we see um, H2A is in yellow. H, so H2A. H2A is in yellow, H2B is in red. I'll write this in black just in case you can't see the yellow. Um, H3 is in blue, and H4 is in green. So we have the histone octet, right? In the middle, we have DNA wound around it. Remember, 1.65 times. But what I want to point out is, we'll use a purple color. Look at these coming out of the DNA. All right? These are what are called N-terminal histone tails. So the N-terminal, so the beginning part, if we think about N to C terminal. And these N-terminal tails can interact with DNA. And this interaction with DNA can affect how uh, how anything, any further process may occur because these histone tails can be post-translationally modified. So meaning they can have some types of groups, okay, some functional groups added to them, and that will affect 
or alter the strength of their interaction with DNA. And if, let's say, it strengthens the interaction with DNA, it makes it real tight, meaning not it's not very available for proteins to come in. If the, if the type of post-translational modification makes its interaction with DNA decrease, then it, the DNA loosens around the um, nucleosome and therefore that allows more proteins to possibly come in and maybe we can go through, uh, let's say transcription for instance. Okay. So these post-translational modifications on these in-terminal tails uh, have some sort of pattern that has been uh, seen throughout history in that they've come up, uh, scientists have, have theorized what's called the histone code. And what we see is that post-translational modifications of these in-terminal histone tails somehow are related to epigenetics. So it's part of this epigenetic code along with maybe DNA modifications, like we've talked about maybe methylation of DNA um, and other types of, of post-trans uh, um, modifications of DNA. So these post-translational modifications of histone tails may be associated with certain modifications on DNA and together that can be passed on to generations, even though the DNA sequence itself hasn't been changed. So it's epigenetics, it's not the actual sequence change, but we have some sort of hereditary possible change. And this is what we're talking about, the histone code. So such things, such post-translational modifications of these tails, such as phosphorylation, um, which would add a negative charge, or acetylation, which would add a positive charge, we have methylation, which is the addition of a methyl group, ubiquitination, which is an addition of a small protein group. Um, well, what we can see is that there are very highly conserved residues in these internal tails, meaning we find them in many organisms throughout. So it shows that there's likely a common theme, a common uh, function of this. And what we see is that methylation, which will increase the interaction, with DNA um, and recruit proteins called chromodomain proteins. Um, methylation of residues on the interminal tails, such as lysines and arginines, um, will recruit these chromodomain proteins. And what will eventually happen is that these chromodomain proteins will actually somehow uh, figure out a way to spread or propagate this methylation to, to neighboring nucleosomes. Okay, and the same thing can happen via acetylation. So um, adding positive charges and recruiting bromodomain proteins, which would neutralize the negative charges of lysines. So acetylations of these lysines recruit bromodomains protein, bromodomain containing proteins, which can spread that, okay, the acetylation type modification to, to neighboring nucleosomes. Um, and then as I said, down here, ubiquitination, that can provide a binding site for transcriptional activators or repressors, all right? So it can increase the rate of transcription or decrease the rate of transcription. And remember, transcription is DNA to RNA. So an example of the histone code, just throw out a few. So if we have an unmodified histone 3, that's usually codes for the fact that these genes are silenced. Okay, around around these uh, uh, wrapped around these nucleosomes. If we have a histone H3, okay, so the the H3 histone protein, if it has a lysine, right? Lysine, the amino acid is a K, and 14. That means it's the 14th amino acid in the protein. So if the 14th amino acid of the H3 protein being a lysine, if it's acetylated, that often leads to increased gene expression. So that's saying transcription is active. But if we have the ninth amino acid, which is also happens to be a lysine, if that gets methylated three times with three different methyl groups, that will be silenced, okay? So meaning transcription is not going to be active, All right? There are a few other 
uh, choices to look at. But one that I want to point out is, look, even the exact same histone, H4, the exact same residue, lysine 20, if you methylate it, so you add one methyl group, it will start chromosome condensation. <clears throat> if you add a second methyl group, that will signal that DNA damage repair proteins to come in and fix some sort of damage that's been, uh, that's been found on this DNA. Or if you methylate it one more time, you're back to chromosome condensation. So for DNA damage repair to occur, the chromosome has to be decondensed. So it has to be loosened from the nucleosome so that the machinery, the replication machinery, or sorry, the uh, damage repair machinery can come in and fix things. So we go from condensed to decondensed, back to condensed, all by having a different modification to the same residue on the same histone. <clears throat> now, we've talked about how the nucleosomes attach to DNA, how they interact. Well, we haven't talked about how nucleosomes are assembled or how they're replicated. Because remember, every time DNA gets replicated through S phase, we're getting twice the amount of DNA. Therefore, we need twice the amount of nucleosomes because those DNA, once put into dollar cells, are going to have to end up compacting again. So the duplication of DNA requires the duplication of histones. So this is going to occur in S phase just as uh, the synthesis of DNA is going to occur. So we have old histones being recycled. Okay, We have old H3 and H4 tetramers remain associated with one of the two DNA daughter strands. And then we synthesize brand new H3 and H4 proteins, okay, in the tetrameric form to bind the other daughter DNA strand. And then we have old H2A and H2B dimers completely being removed and then either as an old set can get back into the DNA or a brand new H2A, H2B will jump in. And it's just a competitive interaction. It's just which one gets to be grabbed in by the DNA and added. Okay. Now, what's important to point out is that chaperone proteins are involved in nucleosome assembly. So we have chaperone proteins. And what those are, they're just proteins that help this uh, reaction occur. And we have what are called chromatin assembly factors, CAF1. <clears throat> and NAP1 being necessary for the proper assembly of nucleosomes. CAF1 is going to be responsible for bringing in new H3, H4 tetramers to nucleosomes. Okay, so we'll say that. This is responsible for H3, H4. And then NAP1 is responsible for bringing in new H2A, H2B dimers into, into nucleosomes. Okay, And without these chaperones, nucleosomes likely will fail to assemble. And even if they do, it'll take quite a lot of time. And this can affect how quickly a cell would be able to get into, let's say, M phase. <clears throat> So one of the last things I want to talk about, about nucleosome assembly, is that parental H3 and H4 tetramers, remember, one of those are going to stay completely with uh, um, a, the original strand, right? The, the parental strand. And then you'll get brand new ones on the daughter strand. Well, parental H3, H4 tetramers will facilitate the inheritance of chromatin states. So now we're talking back to epigenetics. So this will provide a template for the propagation of any pre-existing histone modifications. So these pre-existing histone modifications could signal the fact that, hey, this gene should be active or this other gene 
should be repressed. And that will affect what proteins possibly are getting synthesized or what at least what RNA are being made via transcription. And so this can help restore the parental chromosome state to any of the daughter cells. So these modifications can actually then recruit other modification enzymes of the histones to propagate this modification along adjacent histones and throughout a region of chromatin. So this can allow the actual passing from replication to replication. You can pass the what's called in the chromatin state. So maybe this is methylated or maybe this is phosphorylated. Well, you start brand new when you add in new, new um, nucleosomes, but you can propagate this spreading of the modifications due to the parental H3 and H4. So as an example, <clears throat> our inheritance of chromatin state, we have enzymes called histone acetyltransferases or HATs. All right, they can bind acetylated histone tails, all right, using what's called their bromo domain. Okay, that will then allow HAT to move. Okay, if we look at here's DNA. Okay, and we'll say that these are wrapped around nucleosomes. Oh. Okay, so these are nucleosomes. So if hat binds, and we're just going to say hat is this. Okay, so if hat can bind, It can bind there. What it can actually end up doing, so it'll it'll bind, adding this acetyl group, and then it can move to the next nucleosome, bind there again, adding another acetyl group, and propagating this inheritance of the chromatin state. And the same can be can happen with say histomethyltransferases, so HMTs, using their chromo domains. So histonacetyltransferases, remember, use their bromo domains to bind acetylated histone tails. And histone methyl transferases. HMT, use their chromo domain to bind methylated histone tails and they could end up propagating as well. And remember, histone acetyltransferases often loosen the interaction of the nucleosome with DNA, making it more accessible. Histone methyltransferases, uh, methyltransferases often compact, right? So they increase the uh, binding affinity of the nucleosome and DNA and therefore compact it even more and don't allow things to come in. So an example of that we can see in one of the next slides. Um, talking about chromatin, chromatin remodeling. So uh, remember, we have our DNA. We have to get it into our 10 nanometer fiber, our 30 nanometer fiber, right? Because we need to compact it. Well, we have our basic unit of chromatin organization being our nucleosome, right? So each one of these is a nucleosome, right? right? So this might be our 10 nanometer fiber. This is a region of 30 nanometer fiber. Okay. And the degree of our nucleosomal packaging 
uh, can affect any DNA mediated pro processes, you know, whether it be transcription, um, repair, replication, any of that. So the ones that are in the less condensed state are what are called euchromatin or euchromatic regions. And they are more transcriptionally active. So the, the less condensed they are, the more likely other proteins can come in and bind. Now, our heterochromatic regions are much more condensed and much less likely to have any type of activity occurring. All right, so nucleosome positioning and chromatin compaction, right? So where these nucleosomes are, are positioned, maybe there's a gene there, right? Or maybe there's a gene in there, right? That will affect whether, this, whether a gene is active or not, okay? If it's in an open region, sure, it can be activated. Well, if it's bound around that nucleosome, maybe it's, or very likely, it's not going to be active, okay? So the positioning and the, the compaction can be altered by remodeling complexes. And if we look at this next slide, you can see what I mean. So in the, in the top one, in the presence of histone acetyltransferase and the absence of our histone methyltransferase, which if we remember right, usually causes the compaction of our DNA, <clears throat> um, this chromatin will be much more loosely packed and it will be transcriptionally available. And that is due to our chromatin remodeler complex, SWI SNF. Now this helps move things around. Maybe it is decondensing the, the nucleosomes, okay, or decondensing the, the fibers, and maybe it's sliding these nucleosomes from a, uh, away from this region, which should, normally have a gene be transcriptionally repressed, but at this point, we want it activated. So the swi sniff complex can move these nucleosomes, so maybe they were here to begin with, and now they've moved over, freeing up this part to be transcriptionally activated. Now, if we look down at the bottom, we have histone deacetylase, okay, HDAC. This is taking off acetyl groups, which means now we're taking away what would normally loosen our chromosomes or loosen our DNA around our nucleosome. So that's going to compact. And histone methyltransferase, the methylation is going to compact. So this is going to compact us more and more, and it won't allow certain machinery to come in and do whatever job it was. Like if we look up here with hat around, no methylation, right? No HMT, and we have these remodeler complexes. We have allowed a region to be opened up that we can actually do something with. And we've allowed, if we're gonna do transcription, we've allowed RNA polymerase II to come in and be able to start transcribing our mRNA. Okay, whereas we don't have any room for RNA polymerase to come in and bind in between these really tightly bound nucleosomes. Right. <clears throat> now, as our last example, um, we're just going to kind of talk a little bit about what we've, what we've mentioned so far. Um, I want to give you an example that actually I've, I've talked a lot about DNA uh, his, or sorry, histone modifications, but actually methylation of DNA and methylation of histones actually seems to be correlated. And then when both your DNA and histone tails are methylated, this usually causes that repressed state. So when we have histone methyltransferase around, maybe the HDAC, the deacetylase, right? We're not allowed to get all this machinery into the open spaces of DNA because there's not very open, it's very condensed. And I, I've mentioned these two words before, heterochromatin and euchromatin. And what we see is that heterochromatin is usually transcriptionally repressed. So it's a repressed state, you can't do anything in it. Um, and it stains darkly with a GIMSA stain. So GIMSA is a way that you can visualize proteins. And that is spelled this way, GIMSA. 
So you can do a gym, sust gym sustain and look at it under the microscope and heterochromatin stains very darkly because your DNA is so compact. Well, the euchromatin, which is transcriptionally active, remember, we're going to be more loose and therefore it's going to stain much lighter with that gym sustain. And just the last thing I want to leave you with before we end this, today's lesson is that we have the acetylation of histones leading to a loosening of the DNA around the histone. And the reason being is that we're neutralizing the positive charges of our lysine residues. And this loosening offers a higher likelihood of replication or transcription. So when acetylation of these tails occurs, we are more likely to be in the euchromatic state. Okay. And when we have methylation of DNA, we are more likely, methylation of DNA, we are more likely to be in the heterochromatic state because methylation of DNA, once again, is correlated with the methylation of histones often. Well, that's the end of today's lecture. I thank you for joining us. Um, thank you for, for being here with educator.com and please come back and uh, see me again.